Sometimes I get asked the question from people, what's the best thing that I can do to my home that will not only help me enjoy my home more, but also add value to the, uh, to the property if I want to sell it sometime. My suggestion most of the time is that a good place to start is with a bathroom. And more specifically, if you're just wanting to dip your toe in the water and get uh, a little something done, uh, retiling around a tub is, is a pretty easy project when it's all said and done. Something that's not necessarily real expensive to do, but will get you started on that path down uh, the road to, uh, to finishing the, the whole bathroom out and, and giving you something that you're really proud of. So this video deals with, with that, how you set up, lay out, and, and uh, install tile around the tub surround as well as grouting and then, and then ultimately caulking, which is a real critical uh, part of the process too. So let me encourage you to subscribe to the channel and that way you'll, you'll stay informed about what's going to be coming up in future projects. Uh, this is one project I'm working on right now, which is actually office furniture that will go alongside a, a stand-up stand -up desk that has the retractable uh, up and down movement and there'll be a video coming out on this uh, in the near future as well. So I hope that video is, is helpful to you on setting tile. If you have questions or comments please, please feel free to uh, note those down below and, uh, and if there are questions there I'll be happy to try to get back with you with a suggestion or an idea. Footage was taken from a larger project that involved the complete remodel of the bathroom including the floor tile. I will cover some of the specifics of how to lay out and set up a tub to install tile around it. With the exception of the area right around the shower valve, the walls and the tub area were in great shape due to the fact that the prior surface was cultured marble slabs, so no water ever touched the walls. But around the shower valve itself, there was some leakage over time. So with the new valve and pipe installed, we are ready to replace this section of wallboard with the one half inch thick product called Hardy Backer. I took measurements with me back to the shop and made the cuts for this piece there. It is a messy process making cuts in Hardy Backer with an angle grinder cutting blade, so you certainly want to wear a mask to keep from breathing the dust. After cutting the overall piece to size, I found the center point of the valve and cut the hole about an inch smaller than the finished flange piece for the valve. By setting tile all the way to the edge of this cut, that assures that the valve flange will have a good base of tile to rest on when it is attached with the screws that hold it in place. I then cut a hole with a hole saw for the half inch copper tub spout stub out. When installing Hardy Backer, I like to pre-drill holes. While it's okay to run installation screws straight through the board, I find that when you get too close to the edges, you can have the board itself break out sometimes. Because the board is a cement-based product, it tends to crumble when you screw into it. It only takes a few more minutes to pre-drill holes, and then you end up with a real solid installation. Hardy Backer itself is pretty much unfazed by exposure to water over the course of time, which makes it a great product to use in showers and tub surrounds. I also like a product called Hydroban, which is an acrylic type mastic that provides an additional water barrier over surfaces. In this case, I'm taking fiberglass tape and covering the areas between the hardy backer and the wall board, then applying a coat of Hydroban to seal those areas. I've also applied a coat of Hydroban to the entire remaining area that will be covered by the new tile. Where the hardy backer is installed, I'm only coating the areas where the fiberglass tape is and where my screw heads penetrate the board. All in all, this gives you a nice surface to set tile on. I'm using thin set as my adhesive for the tile. When installing tile on walls, always remember that you want to create level lines to install your tile on. If you remember that one thing, you're well on your way to having a good looking final installation. Now the tub is not necessarily going to be level. It will also have places where it may have a ridge that turns up under the wall board. So start by finding the lowest point where the tile will be installed against the tub. And you can do that with a level. At that spot, take a full piece of tile and place it against the wall and make a mark 
on the top of the tile. It is at or below that mark that you want to draw a level line all the way around the three sides of the tub. You're shooting for about an eighth of an inch gap between your tub and the first row of tile. This gives you a good joint for caulk that will be applied in the corner later. It's a little bit tedious making these cuts, but take your time and get them right because the quality of these cuts makes the difference between a professional looking job and a hacked up one. The purpose of this first row of tile is to give you an absolutely level foundation to begin stacking additional rows of tile on top of. I'm using 1 8 inch spacers to help me align my first row. This is probably the most critical step of the whole process. If you don't get this right, you will find that as you begin adding tile to the wall, that any misaligned tiles will begin transferring that error to the tiles above, and in fact, magnifying those errors. So if you're going up another six feet with tile, you can imagine the kinds of problems you'll be seeing with your alignment. There are many factors such as bows in the wall and slight variations in the size of the tiles that can start causing your tiles to get offline. So use your spacers to keep your tile on track. I will also continue to add level reference lines as I move up the wall until I get near the top of the tile installation. In order to keep the tile aligned in the corners, make sure you install all three walls of tile as you move up. Don't make the mistake of installing six feet of tile up one wall and then coming back and trying to line up another six foot section of wall with the first. You don't have to have a laser to do this job, although they are not that expensive anymore and really do come in handy. An accurate level will accomplish the same job, preferably a four foot level in a tub surround situation. As I continue adding tile to the wall, I'm trying to use my spacers to maintain consistent grout joints between the tiles. However, once I get to the next level line, I will adjust my grout joint spacing below if needed to make sure my tiles line up with the next level line. One thing to note is the edge of the tile you see here. In this case, there are no edge pieces available to give the tile a finished look. Those pieces are called bullnose or surface gap, but are not made for this particular tile. In cases like this, I back cut the edge of the tile, which means I'm cutting about a 45 degree angle off the exposed edge in order to create an area to pack grout into. By taking masking tape and applying it to the wall next to the tile, you can tightly pack grout into the space and after washing it down, remove the tape and get a very defined grout joint that will also have good durability. Here's an example from another job. Now with two rows of tiles set, the job is pretty well on its way and almost installs itself after that. Well, not really, but I can kind of make it look that way. One of the things to notice here is the plumb line running up the center of the back wall. This tile is being installed in a brick pattern, and I use that line as a reference to start each row of tile. Since it's exactly in the middle of the wall, my cuts on the left and right corners end up being almost the same for each row. Grouting is grouting, and it's not one of my favorite parts of the job, although it is one of the most important. You mix grout to allow it to be easily worked into the joints. In most cases, that's about the consistency of a half melted bowl of ice cream. It's a pretty good place to start. Different types of tile will soak up the moisture in the grout at different speeds. So you need to experiment a little bit with your tile in order to get the mixture that works best. About five minutes after grouting an area, you should be able to come back and wash down the joints to see that the grout is beginning to firm up in the joints. If the grout is still a little runny, you may want to add more dry grout to your mixture to thicken it a little. So keep floating in grout and washing down the joints until you get the look you're wanting for your grout joints. After finishing a section, I like to come back with a clean bucket of water and wipe down the tile one more time to remove excess grout film from the surface of the tile. This makes the final step of buffing down the tile with a cloth when it's completely dry, less dusty. I don't worry about the corners too much when applying grout I'm ultimately going to come back with a matching sanded or unsanded caulk, depending on the installation, and apply that in the corners. The flexibility of the caulk in the corners will keep the corners sealed when there is movement between the two walls at the corner. Grout in place of caulk in the corners will always crack and not provide a waterproof seal in the corner over the long term. 
Once the grout is dried and you have a fine dust on the surface of the tile, you can take a cloth or paper towels and use furniture polish to buff off the excess dust. While you're doing that, keep an eye out for pinholes or thin areas of grout and touch them up as you go. The furniture polish not only helps keep the dust from getting airborne, but it also makes the tile shine. The secret to caulking is to not get more caulk in the corners than you need. This means that when you cut the tip off the tube of the caulk, start with a small hole, maybe the size of a matchstick. Then, depending on how firmly you are squeezing the caulk gun, adjust the speed of your movement to leave a consistent bead of caulk in the corner. Only work an area of one to two feet at a time. Next, take a damp sponge in one hand, wet your finger on the sponge, and then go to the corner where your fresh caulk is and press your finger into the corner against the caulk pulling it about six inches or so. Continue dampening your finger on the sponge and move down the bead of fresh caulk. If the caulk is squeezing out beyond the left and right sides of your finger, you have too much caulk in the joint. So reduce your squeeze pressure on the caulk gun or increase your speed of application of the next bead of caulk. As you remove excess caulk from the corner with your fingertip, use enough pressure to get a clean straight line of caulk against the tile. If you occasionally hear a squeak like tennis shoes on a gym floor from your fingertips squeaking against the tile, you're doing it right. It takes a little practice. When installing accessories like, in this case, the soap dish, mix really stiff thinset and apply it to the back of the dish. There may be holes in the back and you want to make sure to squeeze some thinset into those holes. Then press the dish into the slot cut out in the tile and push it in until it begins to come in contact with the surface of the tile. Take a sponge and your finger again, much like when you're caulking, and remove the excess thin set that is squeezing out. It's going to take a little while for the thin set to start to cure, so you can take some masking tape and use it to hold the dish in place until the thin set has set. Do not use anything but thin set to install these kinds of ceramic accessories. Finish off the soap dish installation by caulking all the way around it. 